Hello everybody, my name is Dara Ryder, I am the CEO of AHEAD. AHEAD is a, an Irish NGO focused on creating inclusive environments in education and employment for people with disabilities. And I'm here with my lovely colleague Lorraine Galler, who is our Information and Training Officer. Hey Lorraine, how's it going? Hey, from sunny Wicklow. Yeah. And what we're going to do today between the two of us is, we're going to talk about exploring and strengthening the role of disability officers in a changing landscape. And what changing landscape are we talking about? I suppose it's really all about the move towards more mainstream inclusive practice to support people with disabilities in the everyday fabric of how we go about our business in higher education. So with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Lorraine to get us kicked off. Yeah, so in this session, we're going to look at a number of different areas. Now, we are very conscious of the fact that we're in Ireland and you're on in the UK and you do use a different, um, I suppose, a different model around how you do the supporting and funding in terms of your group, you know, your students with disabilities. So we're just going to talk about it from our um, perspective and see if you can grab a few nuggets from us in terms of how we've dealt with that sort of changing landscape where there is now, you know, more than ever, the number of students um, is, is, is rising definitely within an Irish context so I, I presume it's no different in the UK so I think at the moment as far as our new stats are concerned is it 6.2 Dara? That's right 6.2 percent of the population who engage with disability support services so in here we have another figure here that's more of a, a self-declared figure based on enrollment surveys which is closer to 10 percent um, and they're kind of our two key figures. Yeah so, so we know so every year our numbers go up but of course you know, our numbers are going up, but the money isn't going up, right? So we're still working off a funding, a funding stream for maybe a few years. It hasn't actually gone up. So in terms of how do we actually cope with that? And it is about that move into how do we support students, not only within the disability landscape, you know, the disability office, but also how can we then move some of those things out into the, the mainstream college environment, right? So within this session, we're kind of going to look at that through, first of all, the models of disability, which I know we're all familiar with, but we can, we can go quick, swiftly over those. And then making the case for the whole college approach, why would we, why would, you, why would we, disability officers, et cetera, you know, academic staff, why would we want to have a whole college approach to to support if they're being adequately supported by you as in the disability officer in your college? So what is the case for moving to UDL? And UDL, for anyone who's not familiar with it, is the concept of universal design for learning, right? We're going to look at the kind of the backstory of it, right? What are the drivers? As I said, I've mentioned funding, so that's one of the big drivers in terms of uh, wanting to move to inclusive practice and also just kind of like the idea that why can't we get all our services or some of our services just within the mainstream right as opposed to being an add-on you know seen as an add-on and um, and then we we did some uh, research and some work in Ireland and we developed a road work a roadmap with the disability officers in Ireland so we're going to touch on that. And then we're going to look at, the, the I suppose, the very important topic for, for all of us and for yourselves is this notion of how can we reposition the role of the disability officer if we move some of the supports into that mainstream arena, what's left for me, what's important, you know. And then just kind of looking at the structures in terms of the, the micro, meso and macro, those responsibilities, what, what does that mean? And then we're, going to, then we're going to look at where we are in terms of in the Irish context, how far along that, that route, that road are we? And then, of course, at the end, we'll have some reflective questions for you, the audience. So hopefully we'll try and make it as interactive as possible. And if everybody can bear with us in terms of our Wi-Fi and those sorts of things, and the odd child crying or dog barking. So, and if you don't mind, so on, that, on that, Ryan, if you don't mind, just throwing your uh, your microphone, uh, sort of earpiece, just down slightly. We're just getting a slight bit of wind in your microphone there, just before okay. we move into the models of disability. And I think it's always. I know you said we all know the models, we all know, but I think it's always really nice to check back in on these quite regularly in my own work, and um, just to kind of refresh my memory and make sure that we are going the right direction. Yeah, so so we all, we all know, and myself, you know, particularly would remember the, the very much the medical model where we see barriers, you know, located within the individual, like, let's face it, you know, I went to Lourdes twice, 
but I was never cured, <laughs> you know? So that idea that it was kind of like, because of the individual, if only you could suddenly, you know, cure yourself, the world would be better, wouldn't have to accommodate you. So that, that very much, that kind of medical model of looking at a person. So, you know, you'd be kind of the charity model where you'd be looking for support and actually look if you get it, you know, that, that idea of, you know, there was no entitlement to support. So really the medical model, I know from in, within the Irish context, it all started to shift in the, in the 90s, right? And I remember being part of those conversations around just, just wanting to have basic basic support space you know and I know in the UK you are much further ahead in terms of your reasonable accommodation and legislation came a lot quicker than, than ours did in Ireland so so that all came about in the 90s say the 96 we released a report the commission for the status of people with disabilities and that sort of outlined the position and what we wanted in our you know how we wanted society to be structured basically and that idea that, you know, it was the way that society was structured that was creating all these barriers for people with disabilities in, in the country. And of course, but since then, you know, we're now in the 20th, 21st century and we've sort of, we are moved in, moving more into the human rights model where people want, which is, kind of, it stemmed from the social model and it is part of the social model with this notion that we don't necessarily want to be an add-on, an add-on part of society. We want to be fully engaged and fully included in society so from that then we can kind of look at it in terms of what we do as a society and how we think about disability and that it isn't part of the margins that it is fully in the center and I suppose that is particularly for me and for a head that's where UDL really comes into it it's that notion of bringing people completely into the center of society as opposed to the social model recognizing that there are barriers and the human rights model recognizing that those barriers need to be removed so that they can be people can be fully included but not not forgetting about the fact that people still need specialist supports and that's a rights model the specialists you know that people are still entitled to have that's those it. The, the, i suppose the difference for me is that it's placing the real the difference between the social and the human rights model is that from an educational point of view what we're doing here is we're placing an onus on both the educational institutions and the public bodies to say yes we need to do everything we can to make the mainstream as inclusive as possible through design and recognize the need for high quality individual supports where that design still provides barriers because it always will because we have to recognize the individual experience of of humans <laughs> and, it's, and, and yeah, and there's, yeah there's so many different facets to the human you know like people will as you say always need different things but that's the but it recognizes the fact that it, people are entitled to have those supports as well as whatever else is in the mainstream so it's like a continuum it's mm. it's not a good and there's not it's not trying to compare or contrast the two models you know between the social model and the human rights model it's just that recognition that people will always need individual supports that perhaps are not that widely available in the mainstream so recognizing that the person is an individual and they will still need individual supports depending mm -hmm. on the disability. So we'll I'll move over to yourself, <laughs> Dara. Myself and, and Judy. <laughs> <laughs> so what you're seeing on your screen here, if anyone can't see, is, is Judge Judy. And the reason Judge Judy is up is because we're going to put you in the position of Judge Judy today and we're going to make the case that the whole college approach to inclusion, which is underpinned by the principles of universal design and by universal design for learning, is in effect the, the embodiment of the human rights model of disability in action within our higher education system. So this is a model with devolved responsibility for inclusion, so it's not just the remit of the disability office, but a model where inclusion is everybody's business on campus. And what that means is a commitment to both the provision, as I mentioned, of the high quality individual and group supports, and a state and institutional commitment to reducing barriers within the mainstream environment and the curriculum. So by doing both of these things, what we do is we aim to reduce the need for individual accommodations because we're providing more, sorry, because essentially what we're doing is removing the barriers that require those accommodations in the first place. And we're doing that for all students directly in the mainstream, but at the same time recognizing that fundamental high quality supports will always be required for some students with disabilities at some level. So our aim, I suppose, when we look at that is to, is to push support into the mainstream where possible so that all can benefit from it 
And we move then, I suppose, from a more transactional model of support, which is that kind of one-to-one, -one, it's a transaction, you're providing support to another individual, to a much more transformational one, in which students can participate far more in, in the mainstream experience. So I suppose we mentioned UD and UDL, all that. I'm just going to take a step back a little bit and just give a bit of an overview of what these things are. I know there might be quite a lot, a lot of knowledge in the, in the virtual realm uh, of this already, but I just want to give a, the sort of crash course for those who are less familiar with it. And what universal design is, well, firstly, it, it stems from concepts in the, the built environment, in architecture, in the design and uh, product design, the design of services. And it, it originates from the 1970s. And what it essentially means, and this is the definition on your screen here from the UNCRPD, uh, so that's the United Nations Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And it says that universal design means the design of products, environments, programs, and services to be usable by all people to the greatest extent possible without the need for adaptation or specialized design. So when we talk about that adaptation or specialized design, that's the reasonable accommodations bit. That what we're saying in the human rights model is they are vitally important, but we need to do as much as possible by design to get the best experience for everybody in the first place. So what UD does in terms of product design, the built environment, it recognizes that nobody is average, that there's no such thing as an average individual really. Uh, so that if you design for average, what you're doing is essentially designing for nobody. And so it's trying to recognize the huge diversity in every facet of human life and disability and neurodiversity just being one aspect of that continuum of diversity. Of diversity and it's placing I suppose it's removing sometimes we get caught in that idea of thinking about disability in its own little specialized box rather than think about the intersectionality of, of diversity across uh, across all individuals everybody's different in all sorts of different ways and universal design aims to to address as much of that as possible through design or to make products as usable as possible through design and some examples on your screen now that you'd be very familiar with are um, um, automatic doors so again those these are products designed for people with disabilities and they're designed to the edges of our society in general rather than to the average and we do that everybody benefits so with automatic doors for example uh, originally designed for people with mobility difficulties but many many others reap the benefits of the flexibility that's built right into this product so we think about things like the delivery man carrying boxes parents with buggies out there in their virtual room will, will know all about the, the value of that product um, and things like people with hand bags, hands full of shopping bags, everyday things that would be different in every single day of everybody's life that could make these products very, um, very usable and flexible. So what happened then really when we talk about UD and education is that people began to take the kind of values of universal design and apply it into the teaching and learning context. And an organization called CAST were one of the, the main drivers of this. They're a Harvard-based US organization. And in the 1990s, they transposed the ideas from universal design into pedagogy and into the teaching and learning environment. So the universal design for learning framework, which is the, the, the framework that they developed, uh, is based on research in both neuroscience and the learning sciences. And so with the neuroscience, I'm not going to go too deep into the neuroscience here because I could feel your eyes already glazing over at, at the mention of it. But basically, in a nutshell, what the neuroscientists at Harvard discovered was that if you give any two brains in the world the same stimuli, the reactions in their neural path pathways will actually be different in one brain from the other. So in practice, Lorraine, if you think about me and you, you know, if I was to put a written recipe for, or if someone was to put a written recipe for a Victoria sponge in front of the pair of us, Maybe I'd make a fantastic sponge and the recipe might make, you know, not, you might not be able to make head nor tail of it. But you put a video of exactly the same process with someone talking through it, then the reverse might actually happen. You might have you making a really delicious Victoria sponge and me saying, this is not working for me. I'm not quite getting what is, you know, I need everything written down in that very precise way for me. Yeah. So, so what it is really is that every single brain is unique and everyone's learning process and pathway is unique did you want to come in on something there right. no it was just I, I totally agree i mean i even know some when i was studying art right in uh, college all them years ago mm -hmm. and you know we all had we did have the same you know outline of a project that you had to do and yet everybody's work would come back and it would all look different because everyone's way of interpreting what we were asked to do was taken up differently and that was the beauty of being creative in terms of an art thing you know in terms of art so it's that notion of you know when you're giving people something to do in college if you're a tutor or whatever how do you know they're getting totally what you want them to do from it 
you know, that their, their interpretation of the material and stuff. So it's just so interesting. So learning is, as this is what casts say, they, they're, they're sort of, uh, what they push out here is that learning is as unique to an individual as their fingerprints. So basically in order to reach and teach everyone, we need to build in flexibility, we need to build in choice and student voice into the fabric of how we deliver our programs in order to, to effectively reach everyone. So the framework itself is centered on three core principles. The first principle addresses the why of learning. So that's uh, calling on educators to provide multiple means of engagement. In other words, providing options for students to get them bought into learning whatever they're actually, whatever you're trying to teach them. So why is it important? How does it relate to their lives? Making them feel like that they belong in the classroom when they have some kind of agency in their own learning. Helping them to set appropriate goals and to measure their own progress. And you know, providing, say for example, valuable timely feedback on their progress. In order for them to just feel like they're, they're making a connection with what they're doing. The second principle is all about the what of learning, and that's about providing multiple means of representation. So in other words, it's ensuring the information you're presenting is clear and accessible to all, and that there's a recognition that all learners will consume knowledge in different types of ways, and therefore there is a need to provide options on how students take in information and how they comprehend information. So that's talking about leveraging multimedia, using group interactions, uh, using experiential learning, like field trips and those kinds of things to, to deliver your content. And the final principle is all about the how of learning. So it's how students actually express what they know and communicate what they've already internalized uh, through that second principle. And that's ensuring that we allow students to express their knowledge in all sorts of different ways. So recognizing that it's not gonna be, for example, a fair representation of someone's knowledge to ask them to sit a three hour exam if they have dyslexia as a common example in, their, uh, in the disability world. That's not gonna result in them having a fair uh, representation of, of what they know. So unless you're actually assessing literacy in some way, then ensuring that there's other options for people to, to express what they know and also to communicate with you as, as a lecturer and with their fellow students as well. Anything you want to add yeah. on that before we move? Yeah, on? I suppose it's just kind of like that, idea, you know, the notion of uh, multiple means of, you know, engagement and multiple means of representation. Sometimes people get caught up in that language around that and it's kind of like not to get too worried about that and i always think that the way we have it here as in the why of learning to me is often the student voice so why are they there how do you keep them engaged when you know it's a tough subject or maybe not everybody in the room wants to do that subject but it's but it's mandatory so that kind of like how do you keep them engaged that why are they there really why are you here you're all here listening to this today then when you think about the what of learning to me that's really about the, the learning this learning space the tutor what you know it's about kind of what they're delivering as you say how they're delivering it that multimedia so what are we actually trying to teach what are they learning and then of course the how is really about the assessment piece so that's like how do you want that material to come back what's important have they reached the learning outcomes and all those kinds of things so kind of like not get too caught up in the language but just to be cognizant of why are they here what are we doing how do we know they've learned it yeah, and we, and we use yeah, they, all the principles start with providing options for us. So we think about from an accessibility point of view, a lot of the work we do is, as disability access officers is providing an alternative for someone. It's providing an alternative format. It's providing an alternative way into a subject that, that the, the current design doesn't. So uh, I suppose what UDL is doing is asking us to try and build that flexibility actually into the delivery in the first place, removing the need for the, the, the disability support services to actually make that alternative. Uh, I mean, what we can do is provide more, more detail on UDL and the links. I think what we're going to do though today is probably focus a little bit more on, on UDL's relationship with disability support because of the, the people we have in our virtual room here today. Just to finish the, the piece on UDL and what it's what it's what we're looking at from an institutional point of view, it's a big mindset shift because what we have is currently uh, is we have disability support services largely being seen as responsible for the support of students with disabilities. But what we need to do is to get that shift going, where suddenly it's going from, they're not my students, they're your students, you know, pushing them to the disability support service, to saying, well, okay, how can I play my part in an inclusive institution? Okay, Lauren, so we've talked a little bit about the mindset shift, and I think you're gonna to start to look at what it looks like actually from a, you know, the, the different levels, the different perspectives. 
Yeah, I'm just going to touch on this again because it's one of those things that you can kind of look at and go, oh, wow, that's a lot of work. <laughs> you know, but it is about um, kind of, as we said earlier as well, about starting small, right? So like even in a head, so we started very small. And I don't know what year it was, but I remember many, many years ago at one of our conferences, we, um, we launched um, the Ahead Inclusive Education Charter, which basically took the principles of um, teaching and learning and they actually aligned them to UDL, but we didn't call it UDL at the time, right? So we did really start really small. So it was that notion of starting at the college level, like the video, you know, introducing it to, the, to some people and then seeing where they go with it. That's sort of like small, small little bits. And over time that it kind of gathers its own pace. And then you could say, well, you know, that moves into teaching and learning policy within the college, you know, it begins to get implemented over time, over time. And then of course, you know, it becomes the meso level where it's across the institution. And I think it was, um, was it De Montfort? I can't remember that lady's name. She was a disability officer in De Montfort. Can you remember? Well, I remember them speaking at our, our university. Her name escapes me out now, but uh, they're, they're and very they try, they, they, they rolled, they tried to roll out, you know, they, they went about rolling out UDL across the whole campus, you know, and that was one way of doing it. But for us, it's been a much smaller sort of move, you know, and then when it starts to take hold in an institution, it becomes that means or level where it's bigger, becomes part of action plans, curriculum design, you start looking at it in terms of how am I designing my curriculum? Am I taking into consideration all of my learners? So it's that move into that area. And we see that in terms of our own work, how that's starting to happen in terms of teaching and learning. And then of course, you've got the national level where the, you know, the big guns start to take notice. So it's that sort of shift over time and that's kind of happening here. And Dara's gonna talk a bit about that later. But it's just to kind of look at that kind of shit, how we shift, make that shift to, to more inclusive practice, but that it doesn't happen overnight, it takes time. So in terms of what are we looking at, right? So if we think about in the old days, back, back, at, this, back at this medical model, we had that notion of being excluded, segregated special schools, and then we move into that sort of integrated environment where we have that add-on model. So they're not, people are not fully integrated, they get their supports from elsewhere and then they land in the space and they're there with the specialist support. So in terms of inclusion, it's more where it's spread out and it's a mainstream, it's a mainstream service, it's a mainstream experience for people. So, and then you're thinking, ah, oh, but if you make it mainstream, what about my role? You know, am I suddenly going to be um, redundant? Well, the answer to that is absolutely not. I mean, as we, as we said earlier, right? Change is never easy, right? But it is recognizing that as a culture, there is that move towards a more of an inclusive um, education. So in terms of what we did, we did a roadmap with the disability support services in higher education in Ireland. So you talk about Head and Dawn, which is the Disability Advisors Working Network. And I suppose they're the Irish version of yourselves. The NADP. And what we did was we looked at and explored the developing role of the disability officer and where they see themselves within this picture of UDL. So first of all, we did a position paper, which sort of like, you know, set out what our vision was going to be in a yeah. higher education. I think it is important right? yeah, to say that that's a shared vision, you know, that that is a vision yes. that Dublin and that head, a, got up together. Yeah. So yeah, together with Dawn, that we 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 came, we, we know we have the shared vision. So so we came together and we looked at that, right? So ourselves and so ahead and Dawn, we looked at that. We we did this position paper collectively for everyone to look at where do we see ourselves, and then we explored the developing role of the disability officer. So where does the disability officer sit in this new landscape of UDL, right? And then. We, we looked at reasonable accommodations through that inclusive lens. So reasonable accommodation still sits within it. So we're not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So it's still all part of this continuum and a continuum which fits into the UDL lens, right? Yeah, I think for me that, that those last two publications will be of particular interest to, to this group here today. And that last one in particular, what it does is actually, it takes a look at 
individual reasonable accommodations as in literally goes through types of reasonable accommodations yeah and looks at how we might reframe some of them through an inclusive practice lens so i think that's a really yeah. interesting one in terms of getting that mindset from the disability office perspective of beginning to think about pushing those supports you know into the mainstream where we can into the mainstream and when you think about your role as a disability officer i mean you've so much to do anyway you're, you're providing supports you're running a service you're liaising with different departments there's so many different facets to your job this in actual fact makes your job easier because you know it frees up some of your time to actually spend more time developing services within an institution that's what we would hope so basically you know we look at this idea of the add-on model where you know access is achieved through accommodations and retrofit and what's exist you know existing stuff right and that it's kind of like that notion of specialist treatment now as we said some people will always be entitled to have that that add-on you know specialist equipment and whatever right but the thing about it is is that access has to be you know considered every single time it's consumable it's not put in place it comes in it's used and it's gone again somebody new comes in and we start the whole process again you know whereas if we look at that idea of good practice it becomes part of the environment so it's designed in it's designed in so that we think about if we think about universal design for a minute and back to the stair you know the automatic doors what can we build into the system that will remain there and that as many people as possible can use it so when you think about like um what possible what example of that might be is that let's say if you have like lots of very very common support that we would recommend for people would be access to notes online right so a very large proportion of the students that are accessing your service would get that as, a, as an accommodation right but why can't loads of students get that when you think about your own population in college and how diverse it is you've got students from all sorts of backgrounds some people have english as a second language some people are parents so their time is they're under pressure getting the notes online would be really helpful so where can we push those things into the mainstream so that they're there they're not having to be done each time for each individual exactly yeah, yeah exactly that, that that piece where that what you're talking about there that support is sitting at the top of this pyramid when we call this the inclusive practice pyramid and when you do that at the top you're making a, a accommodation for one time one individual but by doing what you're talking about there Lorraine, what you're actually doing is you're pushing that support further down the pyramid you're making it available to everybody through for example it could be a college policy that would say all lecturers have to provide notes in advance of class and then suddenly everybody's getting the benefit of this thing and it becomes part of the culture of the of the institution and i yeah, think that, that absolutely. Word culture is key in this and even like when we think about things like technology right so you think about like young people coming up nowadays in my own child so into the technology right why can technology not be more mainstreamed you know that notion of things that we think are specialist like when we go back to even say the tv remote where would you be without your TV remote? That was actually invented for somebody who was quadriplegic. But now we take for granted that every, every one of us can't live without a remote control. In fact, many TVs are designed to have no buttons on them. So if you take that concept of something that was very specialist and you make it available to everybody. So say, for example, recording. When we think about, say, one of the big things that comes up all the time in terms of colleges is, is students recording my lectures, right? But actually... There are many reasons that people might need to do that. So why don't we make that more available? And actually, we were going to touch on this just very quickly because I know time is of the essence in terms of this presentation. But touching on this notion of now with the whole kind of COVID situation and people having to be off site for the coming year where recording is going to come into its own and technology has come into its own. So this notion of pushing things that were necessary, that were, you know, specialists at the top and pushing them down where they're not specialists anymore. They're just part of the fabric of, of our college, you know? So in terms of um, redefining your role, right? As I said, the disability service has many, the disability officer and the service has many, many remits, right? So, you're working with individuals um, with particularly with high support needs. So that's always going to be part of your role. We can't see that ever changing.
right? Um, but why can't you be a strong driver of inclusive practice? Perhaps you are already, but it's that notion of you have so much experience and so much knowledge around inclusion. That inclusion, you could be the driver of this inclusive practice and at a leading role, as we say in the slide, of that whole college approach, because you have so much knowledge, you may already be doing it, but why is it not being moved further into the center for you and you're becoming a center of expertise, right? The challenge for you and the challenge for us is to make this, you know, to make inclusivity internalized so that it's a general ethos of the whole place not just this notion of you know inclusion or special support oh that's for a different group you know bringing it into the mindset that inclusion actually is for everybody and that you can be a driving force in that and that you should be in the center of that conversation because you have so much knowledge you know you're a pivotal source of knowledge in this so kind of that's really it. and that's a very interesting document as well like all of these documents that we're discussing today are actually available as well on our website you know but that i think is going to be the rede redefining of the role and dara's going to just talk about like where we are in terms of that at the moment yeah this is i mean it's just to really to wrap up uh, uh, and it's just to say listen we're uh, we've been working on this a long time and we still have a long way to go but just to, to, to give a sense of some of the things that tell us that we're moving in the right direction. I mean, we would run uh, C professional development on uh, universal design for many, every single time we run it that sells out within, uh, within a day or two. So it, there's huge demand for that, there's increasing demand and we're actually running a major national rollout for several hundred practitioners, uh, for Irish practitioners later on this year. And we expect that to be sold out too. So I think that's a really positive sign. Uh, there's, there's positive signs that universal design will feature much more prominently in the national access plan for, uh, for equity of access to higher education, which the new one will, will start in 2021. It already is referenced in the current one, but we hope it will take a much uh, stronger, brighter place. The new national uh, further education and training strategy, which is just launched, actually places the idea of, and I use this language as a quotation, consistent learner support underpinned by the principles of universal design as a strategic priority uh, within that document. So again, we're starting to see things happening at different levels. And we're beginning to see the language of universal design and universal design for learning appearing in college policies and institutional strategies all over the country now. An example, a new institutional strategy was just launched by uh, the National University of Ireland uh, in Galway, um, which is, that was released in January. And again, places universal design as a strategic commitment. So I think we're really starting to see the, this whole college approach develop and evolve and that doesn't mean we're there yet but far far from it and i always think of these things anyway as an ever evolving continuum that we never sort of we never land at a destination with, with accessibility and inclusion it's always something that develops as our, our societal um our societal approach to people with disabilities and to diversity in general develops as well and I suppose just to give you with some, leave you with some links, we have head.ie slash roadmap is the, the documents that we referenced in this session. And head.ie slash UDL talks more about the yeah, Universal Design for Learning and gives a strong introduction to that. So you may be interested in those links. We'll make sure that um, NADP can share the link for the video as well. And just to leave you with three reflective questions for you to consider. Again, we're not specialists in the UK model of provision, but we know that there has been a strong link between the DSA and students, uh, I suppose an individual link between the support and the student, uh, which has existed a long time in the UK. Um, um, one of the questions we'd like to ask is, is the current model of provision in the UK actually a barrier to, to equity in terms of barrier to the whole college approach really is what we're asking. And we're asking what can you do in your institution to promote a system where inclusion is everybody's business? So how can you begin to be the voice if you're not already um, working on this or if you are already there, how can you further this cause within your own institution? And lastly, a kind of a question just relating to the times that we live in. Has COVID-19 highlighted the importance of the whole college approach to inclusion? I think time is, uh, is defeating us around with you. Any, any thoughts to wrap up? No, I think that's it really. Um, I hope you got a lot from this session and we look forward to interacting with you over the chat. Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, take care and stay safe.